Um, hi, thank you for coming early to this, uh, to this event, to uh, the seminar. And uh, I wanted to start off just to give you an idea of uh, how I ended up being a part here. Um, I've been in the industry, the data industry, not this industry, for a very long time. Um, I'd say 30 years. And like many of my fellow students, when I was going to college, I had no clue what I really wanted to do. Uh, I just knew that I really liked to learn and I really liked to go to class. I uh, didn't necessarily like doing the homework, but it was just learning things, connecting things, and, and how does econ relate to social, and how does social relate to politics, and how does politics relate to international relations, that's really my background. And uh, I got out, and I was able to uh, land a job where I got to play with data. I was like, this is so cool. I can read charts all day and figure out what's going on, and, and do analysis, and research, and they're paying me for it. Wow. Awesome. And then you're like, okay, now what? What do I want to do? But where I was at the time, it was a uh, think tank on predictive analytics. Everybody had a PhD. So, okay, I'm not really a scholar in that way, but I really like to learn. So I went and I got a PhD. Now, that didn't take four years, it didn't take six, it didn't take really long. But it definitely taught me the way to start combining quantitative with qualitative. Not that I wasn't doing it before, but it was really about getting through those classes and getting through that. So you get through grad school. And I came out and, you ha and I had a PhD in economics. Uh, and this is before big data. This is before data science. This is more in the realm of the, the internet and using the internet for commerce was just starting. And I got out and I started looking for jobs in startups and the web. And people looked at me like I was crazy. Like, why would you do that? You have a PhD in economics. Why do you want to be a project manager for a web company? Like, because that's where it's at. And that's where the data's at. And that's how it starts. And everything that I've done since then has been, where is the data? Right? Which is why I'm in ad technology right now. Because ad technology, as much as we get beat upon, we are doing some really cool stuff. Why? Because we have the systems and we have the data in order to experiment. We have the systems and the data in order to figure out solutions that can be used elsewhere. And that's why ad tech is really cool. So, come back to what I'm gonna talk about today, which is using data differently than you might have thought and particularly, I'm going to talk about how we use deep data for brand management. And I don't think of it as brand management. Think of it more about how do you marry science with art? Now, let me give you an idea of how this started. I work for Distillery. Distillery is a uh, company that has a very agile data and technology platform. We have tons of data scientists, tons of engineers, and we focus on using science and data in order to find the right audiences. That's great, right? We spend a lot of time figuring out which audience works for which brand, how many different micro audiences exist for each brand. But we're not really addressing the creative side. Most of us don't address the creative side. We're applying big data to targeting. We're not applying big data to messaging. So we decided that we would carve out resources to create a lab, which has evolved into a whole digital intelligence area for us, to ask the question, how can we marry science with art? And you can imagine, we're like, well, where do we start? What do we do? And I have my colleague, Irina, here, who's been in this in the beginning, and she comes from the art side. So you're able to start thinking, okay, how do we understand people's reactions to art. How do we understand, how do we use data to take that and optimize creative for our clients? So I'm going to use a few slides and that's it and the rest is talking. I'm going to show you uh, three different images. I'm going to let you look at these images for probably about 30 seconds if I can count that long. 
And then I want to understand what you're, what you're thinking. Can you describe how you feel about these particular images? Some of you may have seen this already, or at least one of them. And there's purpose of science for those who are listening. I think if you're looking at it, you understand why I want to give you more than a few seconds to, to take a look at this, this creative, this photo. So what, what are some reactions? What are some thoughts on this? Can you describe how you feel about this? Anybody? Confused? Disturbing? Sad? Okay, let's try the next one. It's contrary to what we're used to seeing when we are looking to someone who has just gotten arrested, right? The guy has the smile of someone who just conquered the world. Even the police officer is kind of smiling, and then we smile in reaction to it. Um, this is Philippe Petit in 1976. He just walked across the World Trade Center, the two towers. He's also known as the man on the wire. Um, so the police officers, even though they had to arrest him, they were obviously there witnessing that incredible achievement. Thank you. Last one. No, I love this one. <laughs> it, why? I, I can't describe it to you. It just it brings me joy. It brings me joy. And it, it reminds me of being in France as a student and sit, waiting at the metro and seeing the big out of home prints that were like this. They're so different than what we saw in the U.S. And I'm talking about 83, right? And, and, and we still don't see things like this all the time. But it was in my face. It was, it was, I had a reaction. It's like, this is really cool. I can't really describe to you my, what I'm thinking here. I can't tell you what resonates. And for any of you who have gone through the Equinox campaign, there's you know, maybe 10, 12 different types of images. And each one's going to have a different reaction for you, and one's going to perform better than others, right? But, as you can see, just by our exercise, it's very difficult to put these in words. So if you think about it, when you're doing analysis on creative optimization, you're doing A-B testing, you're doing uh, focus groups, you're doing surveys, you're asking individuals to be able to identify how they're feeling, and put it into words, they might not have the words to do that. Think about that. Now, another story which I love is that Claudia, my colleague, comes from East Germany. They didn't have advertising when she grew up. So she had she had no clue what an ad was. 
Think about her ability to be able to explain why she reacted to a certain act. So this is the premise of what we were thinking when we were like, okay, let's start thinking about this in terms of big data. Let's figure out, since we already know that if you harness big data properly, you can figure out unknown signals, unknown patterns that the machine can figure out that we as humans can, how do we apply that to creative? And that's what we did. So it started out with a test, as we all do. And luckily, we have the ability and the resources to just run with it. We took three creatives and one PSA. And the creatives were just images. And we just threw it out there. We did a random uh, campaign, threw it out there to see what would people do if they got this image. Digital. This is digital, so it's through our platform. Would they click through? What would they do? So we had different images. We had uh, like a scary monster one. We had uh, we had people playing ball. We had um, PSA, which was kind of boring, <laughs> as most PSAs are. Uh, and we had one other. And what we found is that people reacted. And we, we had the image go directly to a, a niche site that we called Microcultures. And we had people react. We actually had people comment like, what is this? What are you doing? Why are you doing this? And others were like, hey, this is really cool. I like that image, right? And what we did is not, we, we wanted to understand click-through rate because that was our proxy at the time for any type of engagement. But more importantly, we took it and we sliced all the results by the audiences. And what I mean is we took it and we basically sliced it with, okay, are these gamers? Are these moms? Are these children? And we found that different images resonated differently with the different micro audiences. So keep that in mind in terms of the test. I'm going to go back because I kind of forgot about the data. You've got to understand the data in order to understand how we can do that or how you can do that if you have access to the same thing. So ad technology platforms usually have tons of data. We see 50 billion events a day. Those events come from different data sources. And I'm going to describe them as I hold this. Right? But I'm going to write them because that way you have the visual. Think about it. 50 billion events a day. Big data. Everybody's heard of big data. Yeah, I know it's overused. Uh, it's not about the big data. It's about using the right data. So you've got browser behavior. That comes through from the exchanges, through ad calls, and it also comes through from Clickstream that we're licensing from third-party vendors, right? And that gives you an overall behavioral uh, landscape for the audiences that we're looking for. We have app behaviors. Again, through the exchanges or through publisher relationships where you're getting information from particular apps. We have location in context. Now that's not part of the 50 billion, except it is in terms of taking off the location metadata, right? What location in context is, is a layer in the platform that allows you to associate geography with context. So geography as in lat long or zip or tile, whatever you're working with, with brand visits, with event visits, with anything that you're doing with your feet. So you think about it, you've got the browser behaviors, the app behaviors, everything that we're doing with our hands. Lots of information there. We're used to that. You bring in the mobility data, and you've got physical data. Physical data, where were you? It is proxy for intent. So think about that. We've got all these different data sets. This is what allows us to not to use digital data to optimize creative and understand micro audiences. So are there any questions on this data? So I, I, I still have more on to talk about, but if you have any questions on this, because this is key. Yeah. I'm sorry, app behavior? App, app. Yep, sorry, that's my handwriting. 
guess. Which we're still just trying to discover. So, good question. So, of the 50 billion events a day, we throw out about 80% for because it's bad, inhuman, inaccurate, right? Location is one of those, particularly because we're looking for lat long from Wi Fi. And if, if it's not lat long Wi Fi or GPS based, then we're going to throw it out. And we're, we're using lat long. And if we can't use lat long, then we're going to use the next uh, level up. But we're going to make sure that we have labeled it that way in our, in our database. But lat long allows you to associate a, uh, a device with a particular visit. And that's based off of work that we've already done on our points of interest uh, landscape. And that's another thing. There's two things to think about when you're doing location data. One, are you using the right location data, right? Other is, are your points of interest true? I, I had a conversation yesterday with a uh, well-known um, platform on the research side for planning. And clients are allowed to upload their own location. And I said, do you have any... Um, like training on that, do you, do you ask people, you know clients what they're actually loading? Do you have any you know protection in place? I'm like no, why? It's like because just because you get a list of addresses from someone doesn't mean that they're right. So you might have just based all your planning off of bad addresses. So these are things to keep in mind in terms of that location data that we keep in mind also on the side on the browser behavior and the app behaviors, getting rid of fraud, right? If you don't get rid of fraud, then you just created a whole bunch of biased analytics, biased modeling, biased audiences. So data matters. Now let's get back to the test. So the test worked for us. We felt like, you know what, there's something here. Now, what do we need to do? We need to find a brand that wants to work with us. Well, you know that can be difficult. You know, I've always said that I want to come back as a brand. <laughs> You know, I want somebody to fawn all over me and put the, you know, the, 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 the crown on my head. Um, so we went looking for a brand, and it took a while. And we talked to a lot of brands, and mostly in CPG, because we wanted to work with a high-frequency uh, marketer. And a lot of people got it. A lot of people want to do it. But they might not have had the logistics or the resources or the, the flexibility in order to run the test. And we found somebody, we found Shabai. And this is known, so I, I can talk about it. You know, couldn't talk about it earlier, but now we can talk about it. And we found Shabani, and we were able to uh, test out this premise that you can use digital data for creative optimization, but more importantly, to determine the audiences and creative mix that makes a difference not only in digital, but throughout your entire media plan, right? And you can't do that last piece without that. And you can't do this, which is browser and location, which is something I forgot to talk about, was the cross device. Being able to marry desktop with mobile or any other type of device, any type of other channel. So having a crosswalk algorithm, yes. Yes. So essentially what I'm talking about is what we've, what we've heard of is using the combination of time, IP, and device ID to figure out which devices belong together. And that is the basis of all crosswalk device graphs that are out there right now. It's, it is a probabilistic approach. Uh, it, deterministic is the Googles of the world, the Facebooks of the world who have that behind their nice uh, walled gardens. Uh, and there are bits and pieces of deterministic data out there that all of us have used to uh, you know, test the accuracy of our graphs, but it is, for scale, it's probabilistic. So having that capability, that data, allows you to use digital data to inform on brand. Yeah. Yes. Yes, and we have done that, but as you can imagine, and, and we have a really good relationship with LiveRamp and others where we're uh, using CRM data, a lot of times we're using it to create new models. Um, but as you can imagine, a lot of people, a lot of marketers actually haven't done the work themselves to connect desktop to mobile, so device IDs to cookies. 
that's changing, hopefully. And I'm looking for that one, you know, just we're just going to throw all our data out there and let everybody use it kind of thing. It's not going to happen. But until then, we have to we have to deal with science. Um, all right, so back to the test. We uh, we had a round of thirty creatives. There was um, five messages and six images, or I could have gotten that mixed up. But either way, there was thirty creatives, which we tested randomly, like against a, a, a random population, and. Um, when we first started, we thought maybe we would able, be able to just use clicks, even though we don't believe in clicks, because clicks are not really a proxy for anything. But we wanted to see how far down we could get, how, how, how base we could get on, on the analysis. And we realized that we really did need to figure out about purchase. And, and honestly, what are marketers trying to do? They're trying to drive purchase. So we took the, um, our data set and we matched it uh, to Chibani's data set with ShopCom data. So through LiveRamp and ShopCom to purchase. We looked for purchase and we did two different audiences. Existing shoppers for uh, Chibani and just regular shoppers in general, loyal shoppers. So we had those three audiences in order to figure out how do we optimize these creators. And we ran the test and we and we found that there were differences and we could drive cups. We call it driving cups. And we found that for um, the creatives that we had in the first round, that there were differences, but they weren't as great as they could have been. So we went back and we were working with OMG as the agency and said, hey, can we get some different creatives? Can we get some brighter creatives, some more differences so that we can understand how well we can use digital data for creative optimization? And they came back and we then did a whole nother round, some really bright, colorful creative. And that's where we saw most, most of the differences between each creative set. And I can tell you that the best behaving creative for existing shoppers was a 60% increase in lifts for purchase. And for loyal shoppers, it was 20%. But that's not what, what really it's all about. It's more about then how do you take this information and apply it elsewhere? How does this inform your overall media? Start looking at how these creatives perform across audiences. And these are audiences that we've built either through location or through behaviors. So we looked at the existing shopper audience, which was something that was the match that we threw Shopcom. And we found, as you might expect, that natural messaging and logo messaging resonated really well with existing shoppers, but delicious did not. If you're an existing shopper, you don't care. You already know it's delicious. That's not why you're buying it, right? We went further. We decided to look at gym goers, right? So people who, who frequent gyms. And we found that gyms where, you know, you're out there, it's like, I gotta really go do it, right? If you're a rat, gym rat, I'm not gonna beef it up, you're at Equinox, if you're doing the Equinox, right? Um, those audiences cared about um, take a break and come back better. Like, work on your body. That's what it was about. Versus the YMCA, which you could call it a gym, but it's really a family gym. And that was more about day party and hey have have a snack so this is just gyms there's, there's differences but what we found then let's compare gyms to qsrs so visits to taco bell mcdonald's and whatnot <laughs> well guess what people who frequent qsrs don't care about whether it's going to give them fuel themselves or going to be natural they care whether it's delicious so you can see that gyms and QSRs are very different. Uh, additional insights. Moms. This is my favorite. Why? Because I'm a mom. And I'm a mom of two adults. Well, one in about a week, right? And 
first of all, most people don't realize I'm a mom, so I don't usually get the targeting that others get. But moms aren't just moms. Moms have lots of behaviors. And we wanted to prove that, so we looked at the different mom definitions out there from third party. And depending on which third party mom segment you're using, depends on which creative resonates better. Right? Think about that. So if you're using third party A, creative B works really well. If you're using third party B, creative C works really well. Audiences matter. I'm going to stop there. Cookie to cookie. Uh, that's a really good question. Um, as you can imagine, you you fall quickly from the overall pop. Uh, do you, do you remember? No, um, I don't. I don't know. I don't have that off off the top of my head. And that was actually one of our, our worries to start with. Is like if you start looking trying to match to purchase data, you have to have a pretty big marker. You have to have a, a lot of frequency with what you've got, and you, and you have to have a really big cookie pool. I mean, we do have a really big cookie pool. We also have the device ID side to do some but uh, I, I don't I don't know what that was. I'm, I'm imagining that it probably fell off to probably below 50%. It had to have, right? It had to have. But I can, I can come back and get that information. Um, so any other questions so far? So we like to say that um, the uh, the latest campaign from Chobani, which is the Chobani 100, we like to say that that came from us <laughs> because it emphasizes natural. And I don't know if you've seen it. They actually, I think they got sued for, uh, you know, comparing themselves to YoPlay and whatnot. Uh, but they really are emphasizing a lot of the messaging that came that we, you know, proved was giving them the most lift for sales. And it's the ability to take this digital information, right, these results, these analytics, and apply them elsewhere that, that matters. Because for, for us, digitally, we can take the cookies, we can optimize on cookies and audiences and device IDs and find the right audiences on the digital side. But what does that mean for the rest, right? How do you then extend that? So the idea behind this is to be able to provide the right insights and analytics so that you can actually use this in your out of home. You can use this in TV. You can use this in print. And really, that's what the whole digital intelligence side of the distillery is doing, is extending the cross-device analytics to normally non-addressable channels. And brand management is just one of those. And so it's about the data science, the data, and the micro-audiences. And that really is, is who we are. And, and, and you know, we've been doing this for eight years. It's finding new audiences that you can't find other ways. And you can't do it without the big data, right? smart data. You can't do it without the machine learning. And to me, it's like, it's so exciting because we keep doing new stuff. So, if there, are there any questions on the Shabani? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I kind of um, clipped that a uh, little bit because their actual messaging was, uh, you know, probably about six words. And then we labeled them accordingly to natural versus delicious and whatnot. Uh, I don't, I didn't write that down for this talk, uh, but it is in our case study, which is coming out where we have the, the, the six messages or five messages uh, that, we're, that we were using. Uh, we made sure that they're very distinct. And I can tell you now that as most of you know, uh, it, for the experiment, you have to make sure that it's set up correctly, right? And we actually, we, we have another um, marketer on board for this solution that we're working with. And so far, we're making sure that the experiment is set up correctly because 
the first round, we're not getting the creative as different as it needs to be in order to actually test it, right? So you have to be careful with, with the messages that you're doing, the colors that you're using, the visuals that you're, that you're measuring. It's a very good question. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good question. So uh, the question was, uh, Chobani has a shop in Soho. I love that. I used to be down on Mercer Street when it first opened up. That's where we used to go for breakfast. Um, it, but it, for this analysis, it wasn't relevant because if you think, it's just one shop, right? And, you know, unless I've got a um, different way of collecting the data, then I'm not going to get that many instances of, of location visits there. And it really wasn't as relevant I mean, certainly we could take that and aggregate it over time and figure out what are those people doing that's different than the people who are possibly purchasing in the store. We could do that. We, we haven't done that analysis. It's, it's a good question. So, yeah. Yeah, that's actually, that would be fun, <laughs> right? We, we, didn't, we didn't look at it uh, competitively in terms of the actual purchase. Uh, mostly, if you, mostly that comes down to data cost, right? Because just the, uh, just the mere fact that we're able to, to do this project and to get a marketer to, like, yeah, we want to do this, and we're willing to, to, to pay the cost of, to get these data. I mean, we, on the ad tech side, we're not paid to drive purchases. We're not. I wish we were. Why? Because we can't measure it as well, because the data is so difficult. And having the competitive information really would, would be cool. I come from the competitive information side. I used to work at Compete, which is now Noah Brown Digital. And that, that to me was like the, you know, two million person panel with all the information. So cool. You could slice and dice any way you want it, right? And then connect it to, when you just connect it to this side, you just get that much more information. We haven't done it. It's a really good question. I mean, we could do it based off of location. We could say, okay, you might go to a different brochure, but CPG, because you can't, I'm not measuring that what's in the basket unless I'm using some of the other players. I mean, there are other players out there who have that, that basket information. Uh, you know, and some of us were working on that early on, trying to get it just from the web behavior, but you need, you need the physical stuff. And I, I see that changing. I see that actually a lot of the purchase data, and you think about some of the activity that's happened in the, just in the, you know, mergers and acquisitions in our space, that that is becoming absolutely more prevalent and, and purchases what matters. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. So Comscore has, been, has come out for years on the uh, cookie deletion, right? And it matters a lot on uh, when you're creating currency. It matters when you're creating currency. When you when you're creating dynamic models, I don't see it mattering as much because if I'm if I'm basing my definition of your audience on a 24-hour scoring period, then it doesn't matter if you deleted your cookies a week ago because I've got your most recent cookie. And if I'm making sure that I'm constantly checking to see if that cookie is in, is in the market, then it's fine. Now it matters if you're trying to use it to to measure and say this is my reach and frequency, right? You have to take that into account. Uh, also, in terms of the cookies, the way that we do the cross device, I don't build it ahead of time. I'm building it as we go along. And so that way I don't have old cookies or old IPs that are in there. I'm just doing it as we happen. And you use the algorithm, you know, at that point in time, say, okay, are these patterns the patterns I want or not? Are these devices and, and cluster the one that I want or not? So that's, that's the difference there. But yeah, there's definitely uh, information out there. And others, and I know we could probably do it. MRC probably has some stuff. Yeah. Any other questions on this? All right, I want to tell another cool thing that you can do with this data. And um, so we spent a lot of time creating location intelligence, but it's not about just um, you know where that brand is and, and what people are doing. It's really about the story about it. So there's two things that we're, we're um, we've been focusing on. One is uh, 
the ability to understand uh, out-of-home sponsorships, in particular for a stadium. I'm not going to tell you that story because I'm, we're talking about it at Rethink. So, <laughs> but, so come to the, our session at Rethink. That's a good plug, right? Yeah, come to Rethink and come, come here to Distillery. My colleague, uh, Peter Ibera and I will be talking about the work that we did to use digital data to understand stadium sponsorships and, and the penetration of, of brand engagement. Um, really, really cool. But you take something like that and you extend it. And what we've done is we've extended it to the politics side. And, it, it, you know, it's fun, right? It's fun. 2012, I was at Every Screen Media. We were working with all the candidates. Might surprise you, but we were a mobile-only DSP, and the candidates on the cutting edge were using mobile. And we were able to do it at scale because we had the ability to go from um, mobile to desktop, or desktop to mobile, rather. And we had the ability to create prospects off of mobile. So we had campaigns from Obama, we had campaigns from Scott Brown, we had campaigns from Ronnie. But it's more than that. That was just hyper-local targeting. Now, it's about who are the audiences that resonate with each candidate? Because they're very different. Each candidate is a brand. Actually, compete. we, we did work on this, a 360 engagement on using web behavior, and, and, and I'm, I'm pointing to my colleague back there, <laughs> um, that where we were using online data to understand what's the different brands. So this is an extension of that. Using this ad tech data, using this big data, we did an analysis on the Iowa caucus. So how do you do that? Well, the caucus is different because the caucus has addresses that are specific for each Republican and each Democrat caucus. So by making sure that we had those places and started collecting the device information coming through, so the visitation, we can start figuring out what kind of insights can we provide on these different entities. Now, we decided to cross it with the university audience, particularly the Iowan university audience. Because again, you can track people who are at universities, students, staff, whatnot. And yeah, university students came out, but they didn't just affect the Sanders vote. They affected some others. And we're going to push that out. That's actually coming out. I'm not going to give you the punchline, but I will tell you that what's really cool about this is being able to connect it to understand where what the audiences are doing and how it differs. So yes, what what's interesting, and I was talking to Chris about this, is that uh, so you've got Hillary and Bernie neck and neck, and based off the data, because I'm looking at the um, how each candidate won each county, very similar behaviors. The data doesn't tell me enough to actually figure it out. What it did tell me, however, is that yes, women are voting for Hillary, but millennial women are not. Right? That kind of makes sense. Also told me that the business uh, segments did not come out for Trump. The other one I thought was really cool is for Cruz, Audiences that cared about health did not vote. They did not come out for him in, the, in that county. As we looked at the county where they won by the top margin. So this is all data from these sources. And applying that connection and being able to have fun with it. You know, create analytics. Tell the story. Who is your audience? It's not just about demographics. It's actually not about demographics. And that's a whole other presentation that I've done in the past. Because I have millennial children. But if you look at their um, proclivities, their interests, you know, you can switch out my face on their proclivities. But if I'm being targeted as a baby boomer, which I am, then you're going to miss out. Because you haven't personalized, not necessarily just personalized to me, it doesn't have to be personalization to me. It's more to my behavior. You haven't personalized to my behavior. You thought that I'm a you know 52 year old mom who lives in New York. Any questions? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So basically, we had uh, 
It's a really good question because you don't have the per candidate inf uh, data. So what we decided to do is look at those counties where, uh, just specifically when we're doing the deep dive, those counties where the top five candidates won by the greatest margin, right? So Cruz, I, I forget the different associations, but uh, looking at the county that Cruz won by the most uh, margin to see how do those behaviors there differ from the one where Rubio won versus where Clinton won versus where uh, Sanders won. So it's, a, it's an inferencing. Yeah. I wish I had more granular data. But a lot of this, it, you know, you're, it's, it's beyond the exit poll, right? I'm looking at behavior. I'm not asking a question. So what we did find, and I was happy, is that the, the visitation rate of, of university students was similar to the demographic as reported in the, in the paper and elsewhere and, and other sources. So, you know, it's like, we, yeah, we all know that, well, you know, you can tell any story. If you're using, if you're not thinking about whether you're using the right data or, you know, and correlation doesn't mean causation, so you have to be careful, but it's really about trying to uncover insights that might take you to the next step and say, hey, I really want to look at this and I want to dive deep, dive deeper, I want to get more data here, or, or not. It's a good question. We don't do surveys. Uh, so essentially everything we're doing is going to be based off of behavior that we have already collected and not necessarily put in context with, with a survey. Yeah. So it's hard to answer that. You know, essentially what we're doing is we're, we're looking at, well, case in point, um, we all, first party data, best data to have, you know, whether it's CRM or Pixel or SDK. That's really the audience that you're looking for, but if you're looking to grow, you don't want to retarget, you want to find new audience. So it's taking that and looking at those behaviors from that audience and then matching it across the board to the data set to, to figure out with machine learning other prospects that have not exhibited that behavior particularly that in market for that candidate or brand or event but they have all the other pieces and they're the prospects. So that's how we're doing the moment. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good question. So we have uh, about um, 40 plus different, uh, what we call crafted audiences, which we create off of behaviors. And that's, uh, you have shown the um, proclivity to visit health sites, or you, it, and it's it's a definition that we can customize to marketer, but we have particular ones that we use across the board. So in this case, what we what we do is we index it against the the population, and for that particular county, all the health segments underperform. Yeah. Yeah. Agreed. Uh, so this was our first test, and we're going to see where we can go with it. I mean, our, our whole core is predicting analytics. We're predicting prospects. I we don't really want to predict politics. I'm not in that game. You know, I don't. I think it's more about sharing um, the uh, the capabilities of what you can do with data. I, my, my good friend and colleague, John Bremer, who uh, has been in this space for a very long time, uh, he's really good at predicting politics and, and using survey data and whatnot. And you know what? I'm going to leave it to him and others like. I do think that it's changing. You know, obviously, you've had different players come in um, in the last couple of elections where you're using the big data, using the machine learning to understand where you need to be. 
uh, for us, it's more about we want to we want to be part of that. We want to, you know, be able to run campaigns for the candidates. Less so about you know predicting whether or not they're going to win. That's a good, have fun with that. Yeah. Any other questions? Sure. Yeah. Good question. Um, so our, the question was, are we integrating any outside information? Yeah, we're in the process of um, getting some uh, specific voter and issue data uh, that uh, we can get from uh, a third party, and that is still in the works. So, yes, I do believe, I mean, you know, survey panels and other are very relevant, and uh, we, we work with that on occasion. Uh, a lot of times we're working with that information just to, as a seed set to do other data analysis um, or other modeling. Uh, it's not a, it's not our core, but we are looking to do that. And I'm talking to one specific provider. Yeah. 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 yeah, that would be that would be cool. That I I we don't we don't do text mining. Uh, certainly, there are people who are out there doing it. Uh, yeah, as you can imagine, you know, there's so much data. We try to keep it to within our wheelhouse. Uh, and we're not, we do many verticals. Politics is just one of them. And we're pretty, uh, you know, we're rookies in that when it comes to some of the other players who've been doing it for the last couple of years. Even though we did it four years ago, that, that kind of was then, not now. So it's a good question. I love text mining. It, it's, it's fun. It's, I did it like years ago in order to provide context to content. And it really does make a difference in, in the ability to tell the story. But we're not doing it. Yeah. Any other questions? Any other thoughts, challenges? We, one thing we, we didn't talk about, and it's kind of, um, it's important, it's not part of this conversation, uh, is measurement, right? And attribution. Uh, we, Having the ability to measure purchases made a difference. But in general, in, for us in ad tech, it's difficult to measure, particularly when you get into the mobile side of things. And so we use a lot of proxies. And we use proxies uh, of in-store visits. We use proxies of site visits. If you're lucky, you have access to the actual um, SDK results, but that's, not, that's few and far between these days. And uh, I do think that being creative uh, with your analytics gets better when you have better attribution. And so, you know, for us, I'm lucky in that we're agnostic. We, love, we like to work with everybody in the attribution side. And ideally, our clients care about attribution. Ideally, they don't, it's not just, hey, you have to have really high click-through rate. Because I can tell you one thing, we don't model on click-through rate. We're modeling on conversion. So if you're looking for high click-through rate, we're not the right people, and we don't do well on those plans. When you switch to MTA or you switch to a, a uh, you know a measurement of the actual result, we're going to do really well, and and that's what matters to us because we we've done the study. Books don't matter, particularly mobile. I mean, it's, it's like one with the greatest one was the flashlight, right? So <laughs> these are things that we have to keep in mind. But then I mentioned this before: we don't always get paid for uh, modeling the right way. So these are all things to keep in mind when you're being uh, creative. And luckily, we have the luxury of being creative because we have a really good core business and it allows us to do some of the R&D that, that we've done in this area. Curious, have you ever tested this particular creative and what kind of audiences spark to it? <laughs> you have not? No, we haven't, but maybe we should, right? Um, it is a uh, an artist, and I forget, um, I believe it is a he, his name, um, that created this collection based on Disney stories and reality, right, and merged the two, and it went viral on the internet. Um, it was
was a couple of months ago. Again, follow up with Renee. I mean, the key part of this, and it would be interesting to see, maybe we should uh, test on this, but I've been out there with PSA and, and figure out what audiences are, you know, over-indexing for this and, and slice it up, maybe with another one. Um, what, what, I, what I love about this is just the mere fact that we think we have the language to be able to express ourselves and measure, and we don't, right? And, and so that's why bringing the, the big data and the machine learning into this side, into creative, and I think you're going to see more and more of this. Look, we already see dynamic creative optimization. Um, it, sometimes, usually on mobile, it's based off of changing metadata pieces. It's not, you know, oh, you're at this location, or you're checking to see a particular product's in store, or, or any one of those, or you switch out the map. It hasn't been as much about really thinking about switching out the creative, although Paper G is trying to do some of that, and I think that, that it's, it's awesome, right? And that's the direction that I see this going. Particularly this year, we've been talking about it at for the last year or so. Uh, I, I want to fix creative. Like, honestly, it's, it, has, it has everything to do with the ad blocker. Everything, right? So, you know, this stuff all relates to each other. And really what, what, why I love my job is that we get to push on this stuff. We don't always have the answers, but we get to push on this stuff and try and change the industry to get to a better place because we all have these tools. So, yeah, the, Please, go for it. Right. Yeah. It is. Yeah, so the question was, if the takeaway is micro audiences matter and you use that information to push it out to non-addressable, right, and particularly TV, how does that work when a lot of TV is going to be a national showing, right? It's a very good question. I think really what you end up having to do in, in what, what Shivani did was probably take the messaging that worked the best, that had the most impact, and use that as a proxy for everybody. Unless you start doing local, you know, local TV or a really addressable TV, you know, um, then you're going to have that where you're going to you're going to waste some impressions there, right? It's just but but you have no more than you did if you hadn't done it. And now for out of home, a little bit easier because out of home you can be very specific, and we do do a lot of work in the out of home space and also in the print space where we're helping uh, media uh, providers pinpoint the right brands to the right audiences, whether it's through out of home or whether it's through their direct mail. And that's much more, you know, addressable, or you can create addressable because of the digital side. Less so than TV, but TV's changing. I mean, I'm not the expert in that. There are many others who are. We, we want to play in that. We have done some addressable, but it is, it's a little bit different of a beast. Good question. I, I think that's really great in the sense that a lot of us get um, locked in into thinking that once we identify these micro audiences, they're limited only to action in a digital space. And I think that, you know, maybe we can talk more about, so how do you take, you, you've taken that learning and applied it into certain media. Um, how would you, I don't know if, you know, maybe we can just brainstorm here, but how do we take some of that other learning and apply it to mass media to behave in a micro Good question. No, I, I think we're still in uh, experimenting. We've actually also done work in content, right? Uh. And so if you think of a um, publisher, they're going to have lots of different titles. And there are certain ideas about who reads those titles. But using the same process, we can, <laughs> I like that. There, there's laughter up here. Right. Laughter up here. Yeah. 
But, and we've done this analysis, it, and it's, it's cool, cool, it's very cool. It's, yeah, I won't swear. Um, in that you can take the titles and you can actually determine uh, what the behaviors are. You can, and either you're using first party data on that or you're using a proxy, and we used a proxy as, just as a point of concept. And showed that, you know, like, I won't name names. So Magazine A actually had a very different audience than you might have expected behaviorally. But more importantly, you can then decide, you can, you can use the data to associate brands that maybe hadn't ever thought of going after for that particular title. Because using the data, we know that the people who actually are interested in that title are also interested in these five types of brands. And so it gives you a way to go back to those brands and say, you know what? We've got people who are reading us that care about you. So it's it's applying that down. I mean, really, what it is is getting to the as a, a, you know atomic level that you can using the data. That doesn't mean necessarily that I'm able to reach you. You know, I can digitally. I can through device ID and cookies, but I can't necessarily on the other side. But I can be really careful about what we're doing. Now, the trade-off there is scale. And who has the ability right now to be that agile to create such um, micro slices for everything they're doing? And that's some of the stuff that we found in the experiment with the creative. But that's going to change because technology has already changed our ability to do targeting. It's going to change our, our the way that we do our media. Already has. Yeah, that's a good question. So the question was, um, uh, blogs talking about that we're moving from messaging to experiential. And uh, I really haven't thought about that, but my first take is that it's, it's probably more about the, uh, the format and the interaction with the media at that point, right, rather than the message. It's like, what, do I need to do something with it? Or, you know, how do I experience it beyond just that message? Whether it's a deep dive card or it's a full full um, full screen uh, video or I have to answer a question or I don't know I, it, it's interesting I, I haven't thought about that um, experience versus messaging you know is messaging uh, to me experience experience is almost like it's 3d right versus messaging is very pop yeah exactly virtual reality the VR stuff yeah that's cool. We're not doing anything, but I've, I, have you guys ever done the VR stuff? Have you ever put it on? It's scary. I did it, I was at IAX a couple of years ago, and uh, put, put on a headset, and you know you're in this room, like, with all of us. You know it, but you put on the headset and stuff, and all of a sudden you're in this, this uh, pool, and you're on the diving board, and you're scared to death. And I was shaking, and all of a sudden they dropped the floor, and they, they, and they put out a wire and they walk, they walk the wire. And I'm like, I can't do that. And I'm literally right here. And it's like, well, if I hold your hand, will you do it? Yeah, yeah, we want to walk. Scared. So just think about that. That's, that's we are an experience that, that's our next project. Thank you. <laughs> Any other questions? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, so the ability, the, what, the, the great thing about this, and I may, might not have emphasized it, is that this was a three-month test. And we got results after, after four weeks, right? And then we made changes after four weeks. And we went back and with a new creative and, and, then, and then did the rest of the campaign. But it, you, can, you can do that. You can say, okay, I don't want to focus on creating, doing new creative. 
I want to take the best ones from the first round and change language to see how well I can affect or change visual and see how well I can affect. Certainly. I mean, yes, exactly. Yeah, definitely. I think I, I don't see why you wouldn't be able to. I don't. I mean, we picked up a lot of nuance. And it wasn't the first round, which was what we'd say uh, wasn't as um, diverse. We actually picked up a lot more nuance there. We just didn't, the differences weren't as great. Well, we didn't as much. So the first round was actually monochronic. Uh, monochronic, it was, uh, you know, the uh, whites and, 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 uh, and browns. And the message, there was five messages. And the visuals were, you know, were kind of normal. So you have to have something. You can't. Like I said, with this, this more recent marketer, um, we're not going to run with the, the ones that they just gave us. It's just not good enough. Quick sample, and actually, the thing I didn't talk about this the methodology comes from work that our colleague Ori Stadelman's done uh, in causal inferencing. Basically, work he's done on the pharma side, where uh, using the work that he did showed you, you, can, you can improve a drug that reacts really positively for the general population, but if you start looking at micro audiences, even as simple as male female, it could be that it's killing females. So it was that work. I don't know the exact, you know, uh, um, metric he's using there, but it wasn't symmetric. Good question. Yeah. Um, so, considering that this is really a um, uh, small piece of our overall business. Right. Uh, for Chibani, we were able to get a, a reaction and get change. But I think you think about Chibani, they're, they're pretty agile, right? They're, they're one of the newer manufacturers. They, they approach it similar to Warby Parker and those. And so I think that that ability uh, was, was ingrained. Um, the marketer we're working with now is somebody who's been around for a very long time. And I think we're just um, tra trying to figure that out. How well. Now, and I have conversations with others in the last six, eight months who think this is really cool, but, you know, they're basically telling me that, well, guess what, you get two creatives a year, and I can't do anything about it. So, yeah, obviously, I can't do anything there. I, it doesn't matter what kind of insight. But, you know, we really did come out this, if you think about it, it, it it's, I think that we're really good at what we do, and we perform well. But I can find you the right audience. But if the creative is wrong, or it's bad, then I'm going to fail anyhow. And so it's really starting to, let's bring that piece of it in there so that we're all doing better, right? We're not being inefficient about it. Yeah, I guess so. Um, so who was it that changed their logo? Uber. Oh, yeah. And what would I do with measuring that? that uh... It's a good question. I don't, you know, I, if they came to us, ideally it would be before they changed their logo, right? I mean, it's almost like you have to do it before the fact rather than after the fact, because otherwise, to me, if you wouldn't use this type of solution, you're going to be more looking at the, um, the sentiment, right? I mean, honestly, if I'm Uber, I'm looking at all the sentiment platforms right now to see whether or not I've got good reaction to what happened. I mean, Marissa didn't get good reaction to the changing Yahoo, right? Nobody cared, and then it was kind of like, really, why? Right? Um, I mean, you guys probably all have instances of logos that have changed or colors and been like, 
really? They paid for that? You know? But that's an after-the-fact analysis unless you're going to do something ahead of time. And I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm not in the business of, of, of you know, creating the, the creative strategy for, um, for a marketer. It's more about providing the data to help you make better decisions. Good question. Um, so we we definitely use PSA to, to understand the lift. Uh, I don't know in terms of what they're doing outside of working with us. I don't know. What what experience have you had in that? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. 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 Absolutely, I, I, I understand that. And that's why, as you can imagine, this solution, if we're, if we're working with two marketers in six months, that's amazing, right? And, you know, ideally that grows, but there's a lot of um, legacy thinking. First of all, nobody likes to pay for data, right? We already know that. Nobody likes to pay for data. So we all are working within the realm of how do you provide more insights and, just in, and, and analytics without adding to the cost of doing that? So you're right. No, you don't want to pay for the PSA. So you figure out how do I, oh, how do, I do that? And for us, it was more about this is the package. This is what you're getting, right? You're getting this package of solution and analytics and optimization and targeting rather than breaking it out per. You know, that's working so far. To me, you know, two years ago, this was a pipe dream. And the fact that we've got a second marketer, well, I'm, I'm, it's cool. But it's not our major major thing. What we do is we find micro -licenses. We just happen to be trying to prove something in our science side. And it happens to marry with everything else that all of us are trying to do. It's like, how do you take ad tech, how do you take, you know, digital and make it more relevant across the board for everybody. So. Actually, I think that challenge is going to be with us for a while, but, and I think, it, and I think the great thing is, it's just like your Giovanni, is that with each solution, it's going to lead us to more challenges and more challenges, and so I, I think we may have some job security in this space for a while, so, but I think more than anything else, we all want to thank you. We all want to thank you for bringing us some amazing stories today. So, thank you. Yeah. And I know that some folks have to leave, but you're here for a few minutes to stick around and answer questions. So, if folks have questions, feel free. Um, as a reminder, um, next week, so next week's class, we're going to evolve a little bit. Um, and we've invited Joe Bruzzo, who is. Um, Joe, amazing. Joe has been in the. Uh, Joe is just a font of knowledge, and he's he's going to join us to talk about how analytics inspires media planning in both new media as well as traditional media. So, a great compliment to our discussion today. So, with that, the lab is closed. Thank you.